In March 2024, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang said that we might see AI-generated games in less than 10 years, meaning that AI neural nets will generate the game as the player plays it, in real time, pixel by pixel. But just four months later, Google DeepMind reveals something that suggests that it's already possible, right now. What you're seeing now is real-time recordings of people playing the game Doom, simulated entirely by the Game Engine Neural Model. Game Engine is a generative diffusion model that learns to simulate the game. So it's a digital brain that dreams up the world and everything that happens as you play it. This is much bigger than it seems. To fully grok the importance of this, you need to know a little bit about a game called Doom and just how impactful it has been. So last year I did a video where a group of scientists took some human neurons, as in parts of the human brain, stuck it in a petri dish, ran some wires to it, and taught it to play Doom. I thought at the time that this was the craziest way someone will be able to run Doom. If you're not aware, there's a whole movement, I would say, of tech nerds trying to find out, can it run Doom? with it being the most unlikely devices imaginable. So far, they were able to get Doom to run on old-school phones, parking ticket kiosks, microwaves, even on a, no joke, on a pregnancy test. So that little screen that tells you if you're pregnant or not, that can run Doom. Doom has been modified to run inside of Minecraft, kind of like the movie Inception. It's a game within a game. The original Doom was released in 1993 by a small team of people, each with their own set of talents, but John Carmack was the brains behind building the foundation of the game, the actual 3D graphic engine that was so ahead of its time. By the way, John Carmack has recently started a company called Keen AGI. Its mission statement? AGI or bust, by way of mad science. By the way, who knows what Keen in Keen AGI is a reference to? Let me know in the comments. So John Carmack basically invents a new way for computers to simulate 3D graphics. This was back in the days when 3D graphic cards were just a glimmer in Jensen's eye. So John Carmack basically figures out how to hack the computer into simulating these 3D graphics. He writes out the source code by hand. This was before the internet had all of the answers on it. This was really before you could just look something up. To give you an example, someone once pointed out that the Doom source code had this egregious error in it. Notice the value of pi, 3.14159265.7. If you didn't catch it, the last number is incorrect. In response to this, John Carmack admits, it's true, I incorrectly recalled the 10th digit of pi. By the way, that set off a whole different set of questions of, can non-Euclidean geometry run Doom? This is where people would change the value of pi from what it is in our universe or some approximation of it to something completely different and see if Doom can simulate that. And no, we're not going down that rabbit hole. But it is important to understand that all versions of Doom, whether they were run on toasters, potatoes, or simulated various other dimensions, they all ran on code, something that was written by a human being. In fact, this is true for any other video game we've seen up until now. It was a result of some smart developer somewhere pecking at their keyboard, and if they hit all the right keys in all the right order, they would write out a functional code for a game and would play out as the human being out that wrote it intended it to. Similar to how if somebody writes a book and you read it, you're just reading what they wrote. Word by word, letter by letter, playing a game, you're basically going through the code line by line, so to speak. You would never see anything that wasn't coded into the game. If there were some chance events, some probability of something happening, that was because the developer wrote that probability. They injected that randomness into the game. But this, this new Doom, it's different. There's no developer. There is no code. As you'll see, even the training data that was used to create it, even that isn't human generated. It's neural nets all the way down. So normally how we train AI, these neural nets, to do something is we give it lots and lots of data on the subject. You want it to understand images of cats, you train it on millions of images of cats. You feed that into the neural net. You want it to predict weather from satellite images, give it lots of satellite images with weather patterns on it. That's simplifying quite a bit, but that's the gist of it. So with this game engine, at its core, it's a diffusion model. 
Literally, this is the Open Stable Diffusion Model 1.4. Diffusion models generate images, and since video is just kind of a collection of images strung together, they can also generate video, although that's been somewhat difficult. And these diffusion models, they're weird. To me personally, they seem weird. Here's kind of how they work. Let's say we take pictures of cats, then we gradually add noise to these images. Noise is basically like the static you see on those old school TVs. It's just random pixels. So as we add noise to these images, eventually it's just a random noisy image. You can't tell what's on it. There's no data there anymore. So the neural net behind this diffusion model watches this unfold many, many times and learns from it. And this is where it gets really weird to me personally. I do not grok this very well, if at all. So we give it a noisy image as a starting point. So basically just static a random static image. And we say, okay, so just, just do what you learned, but just do it backwards. So you saw us turning a cat into this random noise a million times, just do that backwards. Here's a random noisy image, turn that image into a cat. And it does, it just does. And it's not any image that it saw during training. It's not just replicating the things that it saw. It creates a brand new image of a cat it learn how to create images of cats. Now, people have posted great write-ups about why these models work and how they work. They all contain walls of math. And as many people, including myself, have said, it seems very hard to find an intuitive explanation for why this is actually working. There's a channel here on YouTube where they put various phones and other pieces of technology into a blender to see if it will blend, as in will this blender Take, for example, a functional iPhone and just shred it to pieces to where it's no longer a functional iPhone. Imagine watching hours of this footage and later realizing that now, because of that, you're able to create an iPhone. Now, I'm slightly kidding, of course, but to me, and I think to a lot of other people, these diffusion models just intuitively don't make a lot of sense. By the way, if you have a good explanation or know somewhere online where they have a good explanation for this, please post it in the comments below. I'd be very curious to understand this, but whatever. The point is it works. Do we really need to understand how this technology does what it does? Nah, I'm sure it's fine. So this Doom game engine uses this diffusion model, but instead of generating pictures of cats, it generates pictures of Doom, AI agents of Doom. Now to do that, to generate pictures of Doom, it needs lots of pictures of Doom to learn from. Or more accurately, since it's actually putting out footage, it needs footage of Doom to train on. And this is where it gets difficult because we don't have massive amounts of data that is labeled, sorted, etc. And it would cost a lot of money to get a bunch of people to sit and play Doom for hours on end to collect this data. So would the brilliant folks at DeepMind do? Well, they create AI agents that are capable of doing this for them. They used an already existing architecture for this called VizDoom, a way for AI agents to play Doom outfitted with the regular view, as well as another view where they can see the labeled objects of the game, as well as a depth buffer that allows them to more easily understand kind of the 3D space they occupy, as well as a top-down map. Next, Google researchers write the reward function for this RL agent. So RL stands for reinforcement learning, similar to how you can train a dog with both positive reinforcements like treats, as well as negative reinforcements like whatever Caesar Milan does. I'm not actually sure what that is. Really, I just saw it on South Park, but it seems like you make a noise and then you poke them in the neck. I don't really know, but that is negative reinforcement. This is degrading. With machine learning, we can also have positive and negative reinforcement to get the AI model to do what we want. That happens, for example, when you hit the thumbs up button on this video. Try it now. I'll wait. If you don't, I will do the rest of this video in that ASMR voice. Do it. But the point is, for these Doom agents, we create a reward function that looks like this. Here's basically written out in basic English, but you get the idea. So as you can see, getting hit has a small negative reinforcement. Getting killed is huge big ouch for the AI agent. And then we have various positive reinforcements for doing the stuff that progress the game, fighting enemies, getting gear, discovering secrets, and moving on to new areas. These reward functions, by the way, are notoriously hard to write because you can accidentally create unintended consequences and traumatize the poor AI, for example. No, I'm serious. 
we've covered an AI agent that learned to play Pokemon Red using reinforcement learning. At some point in the training, it refuses to approach a certain building. It's as if it developed an irrational fear of being anywhere near it. Interesting, the author of this video describes it as the AI agent being traumatized by some event that happened inside that building. Now, obviously, that's us projecting some human behavior on this AI, but that's really what the behavior looked like. The AI trainer starts digging deep to find what traumatic event could have caused this. And lo and behold, he finds it. The building contains some sort of a bank to store your Pokemon. So if your level 5 Bulbasaur needs to be just banked for a little bit, you can deposit it into that storage until you needed it. It's not a big deal, it was just a way to manage your inventory, to free you from clutter. But the rework function really emphasized the AI agent to focus on leveling up and improving their Pokemon. So having more Pokemon and having those Pokemon have higher levels meant positive reinforcement for our little AI agent guy. Its life satisfaction was high as long as he was catching and leveling Pokemon. Depositing a few high level Pokemon into the bank meant a massive loss of combined Pokemon levels, at least on paper. Now, this was a traumatic life event for a little Pokemon AI agent, after which he flat out refused to go anywhere near that building. Now, of course, the whole problem was that the developer assigned the wrong negative reinforcement to something. Depositing the Pokemon didn't mean that the AI agent did something wrong or was a complete failure. It just meant we had to go in and change the reward function so that the agent could continue progressing in life instead of being stuck in one place because of some past trauma. Now, we as humans can also do this. It takes years of your life, thousands of dollars, and is called psychotherapy. I apologize if I went on a side tangent there. I'm not sure what my point was. I guess don't traumatize your little AI agents if you choose to bring them into this world. I don't know. Let's just move on. So all these AI agents play these games and collect labeled data. For example, when they press the shoot key, that action is labeled for the corresponding frames of the game. So when we feed this data into game engine, it learns what happens when the shooting action is triggered. Later, we ask it to predict what that would look like. We also have our ground truth. This is what we know actually happens. For example, in this frame, imagine what happens when I press the shoot button. Do you have an image of that in your mind? Okay, here's what actually happened. How close were you? If you played Doom or first-person shooters, you probably were pretty close. So we test this model to see how closely its predictions match the ground truth, aka what actually happened. Eventually it gets really good at predicting what happened and is basically able to simulate the game in real time, responding to the actions that the player attempts to take. Now, so far we talked about frames and still images. And of course, a video is basically a bunch of images strung together in some meaningful order. This is what researchers sometimes refer to as temporal coherence. The images that make up the video have to make sense, have consistency. They have to be coherent when we put them together. Now, video generation models have kind of been bad at this in the past, but they're getting a lot better. But with this model, look at this progression of images taken every 10th frame where the player is standing still. Nothing's moving. Even though nothing's changing, notice how quickly the quality degrades. Now, the paper lays out a number of approaches, such as noise augmentation, that help to not produce these issues. They talk about how they handle the HUD, the heads-up display at the bottom of the screen, etc. We're not going to go into these, but they're outlined in the paper. Results. So how well did this model do its job? Well, the researchers recruited a number of humans to see if they could distinguish between the real life and the simulation. In this case, actual Doom gameplay versus the gameplay generated by a game engine. As they put in the paper, overall, our method achieves a simulation quality comparable to the original game over long trajectories in terms of image quality. For shorter trajectories, human raiders are only slightly better than random chance at distinguishing between clips of the simulation and the actual game, meaning that they can't really tell the difference all that well. As they say, we provided 10 human raiders with 130 random short clips. They had clips of 1.6 seconds and 3.2 seconds, so just quick little clips. And they showed the simulation side by side with the real game. And the raiders were tasked with recognizing which one's real. The raiders only chose the actual game over the simulation in 58% of the time in the shorter clips, 1.6 seconds, and only 60% of the time in the 3.2 second clips. Again, keep in mind, random chance is 50-50. So yeah, they're doing better than just blindly picking one, but not by much. And 
that's basically it. Now, obviously we skip a lot of the nitty gritty details. The actual paper is a treasure trove of interesting tidbits and tactics that were used to make this happen. This was the result of a lot of smart people working very hard on creating this. If you want the full paper, I will link it down below so you can peruse it at your own leisure. If you enjoyed this, please hit subscribe. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.